uh, yeah, call actually. Uh, thank you so much. I um, let me just start the timer because I have to fill uh, fill this house in on apologies. Fill this house in on a thousand years in five minutes. I'm, uh, but let me begin by saying good afternoon to everyone here, Chair Sherman, and everyone else. Um, I want to begin by saying that I'm mindful of the ironies of speaking here in non-communal terms, being someone who's a Kashmiri Pandit herself by birth, um, but also being someone who's from Kashmir, grew up in India, lives in England, uh, and is speaking in the U.S. today. So there are multiple colonial transitions there that are important. And I think that... Um, because my written statement is already with you, uh, I will focus on some of those points. But let me just respond to a few things by start, starting to say, by start, uh, starting out by saying that the parallels with uh, with Nazi Germany and with the Holocaust are actually very apt, because the RSS in India and about whom concerns were raised in the morning as well is a nationwide paramilitary that is the ideological parent of the current ruling party, and the RSS has avowedly an idea of turning India into a Hindu nation. It also has this idea of an undivided India where everything, everything else in the region will become a part of a Hindu India. Please also remember that the New York Times in 1922 had profiled Hitler saying that Mr. Hitler's anti-Semitism is neither as, uh, neither as violent nor as genuine as it sounds. So things take time to unfold and the proto-fascist trajectory that sadly the, the secular democracy of India is on is very worrying for us all. Let me also say that Shujat Bukhari I have been to Kashmir every year, you know, uh, 2015, 16, 17, 18, 19, including this year during the elections when the whole place was deserted. Uh, and and Shujaat Bukhari on that visit in at the end of 2016 was the person who had launched my novel. I also write fiction in Kashmir. There is a video of that on YouTube. And he had spoken about the value and worth of what I'm saying. So I do not represent here Indian interests or Pakistani interests. And in fact, that is precisely the problem that the people who speak about Kashmiri self-interest and the rights of Kashmiris themselves are the ones who are most vulnerable uh, from any and every side. The communal politics serves no one. It does not serve the Indians. And Kashmir, if Kashmir were a communal issue, then, then Muslims in India would feel the same as Kashmiri Muslims, and they do not. So it is not a communal issue. It is al albeit a, an issue that has been communalized. I also want to say that every other day for Kashmiris is a commemoration of a massacre. And when Indians, and this is really not personally against Indians or Pakistanis, but when Indians expect... Uh, an acknowledgement of a massacre like the Jallianwala Bagh massacre, where, you know, where under General Dyer, fire was opened on unarmed protesters. What about all of the Kashmiri protesters? What we are asking here is really very, very simple. We're asking for human rights, for substantive democracy, and for the question of freedom, that people who have been fired upon for just gathering nonviolently over the years in numerous massacres that I have listed in my statement, there should be an acknowledgement from the state to say, we are sorry. Nothing can move on until there is an acknowledgement of all of the human rights violations that have gone on for these people who have been an important site of early Buddhism, who have seen Hindu rulers, who have seen Mughal rulers, Afghan rulers, and, and then who have been sold for the equivalent of something like 150,000 US dollars uh, in 1846 by the Treaty of, uh, by clauses of the Treaty of Lahore and Amritsar without their consent, and who have then had an unrepresentative ruler who's, uh, you know, throughout the 19th century, it's a story of absolute tragedy. And when we come into the 20th century, I mean, Kashmir is one of the first interstate disputes that the UN was prominently involved in. And there are several resolutions in those early years that the UN was actually trying under various people to demilitarize under Norton, under Dixon, under Menzies. This is a long and complex history, but that complexity should not blind us to the very simple, should not uh, obviate from us, obfuscate from us the very simple fact that there is a political problem here which is compounded by human rights violations and the international community has a role because this has not just uh, implications for Kashmiris who are currently under siege and under collective punishment being deprived of their very basic rights but it also has regional and potentially global implications because people travel across borders and ideas when they are suffocated have an, and dissent when it is suffocated becomes the uh, you know the hardest to handle so I want to say um, I also want to look at the time because can, can someone just tell me how many minutes seconds do I have 
I do have time. Okay. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I do want to. Uh, yeah, I want to take my five minutes for sure. The the question here is really not so much about Article 370. The fundamental question here is about the consent of the people. If something is being carried out, if my time, my time, my time. If something is being carried out for people's welfare for their development, then why does it need tens of thousands of troops being brought in? Why does it have to happen overnight without absolute any absolutely any consultation of the people with placing even the pro-India politicians in prison and then depriving the population of the right to say anything? If it is for their good, then why won't anyone of them be allowed to say something about it? This is an egregious human rights violation. It goes against consent, goes against fundamental principles of dissent as they relate to democracy and as people who are being claimed in the name of a democracy as rights bearing individuals this is something that they fundamentally should be uh, you know allowed to um, to do this is Thank arbitrary you. use Thank of you. power with no accountability Thank you.